Hey, welcome back to the channel. Uh, this video is in response to RJ Knives' uh, uh, open tag uh, for your hanger knives or safe knives. And so knives you don't really use. And um, so I'm going to cover a few of them I have here and why that those knives, uh, I don't use them at all. And all of these knives I don't use at all. And I have a reason why. And so um, if you'd like to hear more about that in the video, um, go ahead and check it out. All right, welcome back to the Fortified Castle. Hide all my viewers. And um, as usual, I just uh, get out of hand so I think um, RJ showed five knives six knives in his video I can't remember but um, uh, you know I had a hard time yeah you always have a hard time deciding you know on uh, what knife to show if you have a few to show and um, but but I thought I'd approach this a little differently and just kind of go through some of these and and uh, not spend a lot of time on them, but tell you, you know, why um, that I don't use them. And so um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with the oldest, work all the way up to these new knives over here. And it uh, should be pretty interesting to you. I've got some good example, interesting examples here. And uh, maybe even the explanation of why they're, they're safe queens will be kind of interesting. All right, let's get started with this. Uh, so this knife right here, I believe, is one of the oldest in my collection. Uh, doesn't look like too much, but uh, it is a uh, friction folder. I believe that dates from the uh, late 1700s, like 1790. What's so amazing about this knife is these pins, the pin work in this knife. This is a horn material, uh, a cow horn, and... Um, these little tiny uh, pins that are set into this knife, there's 500 on each side. In addition to that, you had inlaid uh, mother or pearl um, spots here. And then you have brass pins up on the top and the bottom and then copper pins. So really an amazing little uh Knife. If you'd like to see the full video, it's, I think it's titled uh, The Most Amazing Knife You'll Ever See. And that's why I don't carry that one. Uh, this knife right here dates to the um, 1860s. It's a Martin Brothers knife. It, it's genuine ivory. I don't have too many genuine ivory knives. I think that's really cool. And you can see... It's a diamond cut here. So when you have a knife this old, you have very old datable tang stamp. And um, listen to that. And just beautiful diamond work on ivory. Yeah, I'm not going to carry that. Uh, this knife here, um, it's a um, fruit knife. Fruit knife. Um very unusual knife, I think, if you look at this. For one thing, it's completely made out of silver. So the blade is silver. The back spring, which is um, filed and worked, is made out of silver. I also have a video on this one. Um, but it has mother of pearl in here. And in sculpted mother of pearl. And then, uh, so here's an example here of Mother of Pearl and an American knife. And here you have that, and it's even sculpted. This also has pen work in it. Very delicate um, sculpting work on this. And um, that, to me, is just, when you think of English Sheffield dominance, and craftsmanship this is the kind of thing you think of this is the kind of thing they were capable of and that's what this knife represents to me um, this knife right here 
this is a holly knife. It's just a simple um, equal end knife. Uh, carbon steel uh, bolsters and uh, liners on this knife. Brass pins and an old tank stamp. Probably dates to around the 1880s, mid-1880s. This knife right here in really good shape. Nice uh, walk and talk on this knife. Uh, so this is not like a finely made knife, but it is a good knife. It's well made and it's typical of what Americans were capable of in the uh, mid to late uh, 1800s. Holly is the um, oldest pocket knife manufacturer in the United States. Of course, it's our business now. But um, it was the, uh, started in 1844. There were other companies that made knives, but not pocket knives. And so Holly was really the first one that made pocket knives. Um, this knife here dates to the 1880s. Um, these are very collectible. It is a, a multi-blade knife. Uh, goes in that multi-blade family. They're called sportsman's knives, or in particular, this would be a horseman's knife because it has a horse pick on it. So, uh, hoof pick, rather. Not a horse pick. Hoof pick. And so, they would use this to clean out the uh, hooves of a horse. I used to have horses, and I've done that before. Not with this knife. But, um, really uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, Dag here that's in great condition for the age of this knife and um, all uh, another thing about this knife it, it is it has everything except the attachments at the end which would have been a pick and a um, a uh, pair of tweezers and so the condition of this knife is just amazing and um yeah, I don't want to carry this around. I don't want to damage this or lose this or anything like that. It's a great example of uh, uh, this type and pattern of knife um, dating back to the 1800s. So uh, next up is this knife. It is an Excelsior. You can see it is a Stockman, but it's not your average Stockman. Uh, you can tell it just has some luscious bone there and it looks fantastic this knife would date to the 1890s possibly up to 1910 uh, it actually can date later so um i'm gonna show you i'll show you here let me see if i can get it hold on so um blades aren't hard to open on this it's uh i don't have any fingernails and so um, you can see there it's a little different. And it has that thin spear point blade that they was very popular at the end of the 1800s. A lot of the older knives had these thin spear point blades on them. And um, you can see the mark there, Excelsior Knife Company. So that company um, what was operating for a very short period of time from... Uh, 1880 to 1883 look at the uh this is a skinner blade isn't that amazing on a little tiny knife stockman knife um i've seen remingtons with that i have seen some like case brother knives that had a skinner blade but, but really not from anybody else this is just a sheep's foot blade right here but these blade configurations are just like um, uh, very old. You don't see them on uh, the knives you usually find around the turn of the uh, 20th century. And so this knife actually could be an original Excelsior. The problem with that is uh, we think um, Serpentine Stockman's came out around 1890. Excelsior went out of business in 1883, so it's probably not an Excelsior. It's also possible that this could have been one of the first Stockman's ever produced, and it is from Excelsior in 1883. Um, I've not been able to get a catalog from Excelsior. I 
and verified this knife. So um, I, I think it was made by Northfield who bought Excelsior when when it when it went out of business, and it probably dates from 1890 to 1910. But just a fine example of what old uh, stockmans used to be like. So I'm going to go through a series of um, Robeson knives. Uh, Robeson just made a fantastic knife. This is a jumbo jackknife right here in a um, uh, sleeveboard pattern. And um, just what the difference in what is so special about these is this is about the size of your normal uh, pocket knife, three and a half inches. And you can see how much wider this knife is. At its widest point here, it's three and three quarter, or I'm sorry, three quarter inches wide. And so they were just a lot wider and beefier than your normal knife. And they're rare. And so this is an American uh, jumbo. Uh, blade geometry is great on this knife. The walk and talk on it is still fantastic. Hear that on there get the... okay and um that's what's special about this knife is it's a jumble that it, uh, it is a pattern that's rare to find you don't see too many of these jumbo knives and uh that's why i don't use that here's another um robertson and mother of pearl it's a um equal in four blade knife and just represents that kind of uh, early American craftsmanship. You have innovation here. This is a um, solid back on the back spring that covers the back spring. You can see it right there. Um, really unusual. Um, they started bringing this kind of back in the 2000s, but you don't see too many examples like this. And it's also in really fantastic uh, shape. This is another Robinson. This is the best knife in my collection for uh, a number of reasons. You can see the fantastic Mother of Pearl on this. And um, it is a pattern called Orange Blossom Pattern. And it is actually a combination of several patterns. So on top, on the uh, uh, orange blossom, it's a whittler. So you can see the whittler set up right there. One main blade, uh, two smaller but equal blades. And on the bottom, it's a lobster. So the knife overall is a lobster, meaning it doesn't have a back spring. Lobsters had the spring in the middle. You can see the springs right there inside. Those little springs right there are the back springs. And also, it is a gun stock. So if you take a look at that, you have the gun stock pattern right there. So it was just a combination of different patterns. This knife is not only finely made, every piece of metal on this knife is polished uh, to a high mirror polish. That you can see. And so the best example is that that is look down at those back springs in the middle down there. And they are mirror polished. I'm going to zoom in on that. So you can see, see the mirror polish on them? Look at that. All of them are mirror polished. Even down inside the knife, all the surfaces mirror polish and the thing about this knife is it's exactly how it came to me I cleaned it up but I have not polished it I haven't put flits on it I haven't put anything on this knife it's in its original uh, form so look at the mirror polish on that just absolutely remarkable Dates between 1910 and 1920. You can see the liners are uh, milled on it. But everywhere, everywhere is mirror polished. Just fantastic. And um, that's why it's a 
best knife in my collection. It's the finest knife I have. Um, finest made knife that I have in my collection. So uh, here's another Robertson. Let me zoom you out. Uh, this is a large Congress knife, four blade Congress knife. These things are kind of scarce. They didn't make a lot of them. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, whether these were a big and got smaller or were smaller and got bigger. And I think they were smaller and got bigger. Uh, I don't see a lot of these in old, really old catalogs, like from the Civil War period. So I think they kind of evolved to get bigger with the demand from people that used them wanting bigger ones. But look at the bone in this. And it's just a fantastic example of, of an old four-blade Congress knife. It's, how big is this? It's at least four inches. I think it's actually larger than four inches. So it's four Snap down. Yeah, four and a quarter inches. Crazy. Crazy big. Uh, and lastly from Robertson is this English Jack. Um, just gorgeous original bone on this knife. And a, a fantastic knife. And um, they just represent uh, the best knives made in the world. At that time period and probably still listen to the walk and talk that thing just snaps on there gator snap gator snap all right so we're starting up here um this is a multi-blade knife looks like a sack right so this is not a victorian rocks it is a J.A. Hankles. See the twins there? A um, couple special things about this knife. <clears throat> it's a um, three-layer, which is not unusual. And then you have these, you have the awl and the uh, corkscrew on the back. This repre re represents the evolution of the, um, of the Swiss Army knife. And so most of us are using, I wonder if I even have an example of it. I don't. Uh, most of us are used to opening this up and it being a cap lifter. And you, you might think, okay, this was a broken blade and somebody just uh, made it into a screwdriver. But actually this is the original tool and it was used for taking down uh, Mausers. So the original Swiss Army knife kind of looked like a TL. It had four blades. One of them was this. And uh, Germany actually made them for the for um, uh, the Swiss. And so um, this blade would date this knife to around 1910 to 1924. Uh, Victorinox was actually one of the, the latest to convert this blade over to a, um, a cap lifter. They did that about uh, 1928. Uh, this is a German model here. I'll show you this right here. It's in fan fantastic shape too. So uh, anyhow, that's you could use this. I mean, I could take this out. It's very strong, nothing wrong with the knife. I just, I wouldn't do it because it's a transitionary type of knife, you know, and. Uh, represents the evolution of of sacks as they started changing. And so uh, I don't carry this around. Uh, here is a uh, Remington, Remington. Again, uh, this is the American counterpart to the, um, to the uh, Swiss Army knife, uh, utility scout, utility knife. This is official Boy Scout model, dates between 1933 and 1935, in excellent condition. This is another knife you, you just could carry, and it would just be fine, but um, I'm not going to take the chance on take. You know, a knife like this represents, how often can you get a hold of a knife like this, this old, and look at the original bone in it? 
and this this is very slightly worn by the way you can see it's not severely rounded over on the ridges so this is what the bone used to look like that came from these knives in the uh, first part of the 20th century and um, that's why I don't carry that um, this is a moose. It is uh, one of the only moose original moose patterns I have. It's a Canton cutlery. Snap in. There you go. And so this knife would date before 1928. And um, really nice bone on this. I don't believe the bone is original on this knife. I think it's been replaced at some point. But it's really pretty. But it's just worth having this knife. <clears throat> you don't you, you don't uh, see a lot of these either. A lot of these old full size mooses, they're kind of hard to find. And that's what it represents to me. Um, this knife right here is a let me get it open. Is a Utica? See right there. And <clears throat> It's, you know, pretty old knife. It's a pre-1940 knife. Um, Utica, I think, started around 1922, I believe. But but if you look at this knife, it's kind of different, isn't it? And you don't have a sharp point here. It's kind of rounded in the uh, center swell on this knife. kind of comes up here to a um, saddle horn, but not really quite. It's very well-rounded. Typical of, um, you know, um, actually English, English type uh, build builds. It just looks different. And again, the bone is in just pristine condition on this knife. And um, to me, this knife represents how different knives actually were in the first part of the 20th century from 1900 to 1920 um, thousands of different patterns really cool knives you know nowadays it's pretty homogenous with uh, what we have available in the um, traditional folder uh, genre uh, moving forward 60s and 70s uh, this is one of my favorite knives it's a, a Wolstein home just a fantastic center swell balloon in whittler and this thing is well made so the blades don't uh hit if you can get close enough on here you would see the tiniest of gap there where the blades are not hitting very finely made really delicate uh threads on this knife but um check out this so the bolster's thick here, and the bolster rounds over to literally nothing. And these liners end here. So usually liners, if you look at this Robeson right here, come on, snap in. If you look at this Robeson, the liner goes all the way around here on the bolster. And this has no liners. They've just rounded the bolster over to almost nothing. It's the same on the other end. And that's just the kind of magnificent craft, craftsmanship that uh, Wolstein Home uh, was capable of. Beautiful looking knife, natural white bone, which I'm sure they bleached, by the way, but um, just fantastic knife. <clears throat> and kind of what you could see in the 60s and 70s from foreign knives. Um, this knife right here, it's not valuable, it's not highly collectible. Uh, it was made, who made this? Jim Parker? Uh, Taylor Cutlery. Okay, so uh, Taylor Cutlery knife. And um, why I think, why I don't use this thing. You certainly could, right? So it's a very strong knife. Nothing wrong with this knife. Lock back. Um, <clears throat> but look at the detail on this scroll work on the bolsters. It's, it's just unbelievable detail and you have uh black enamel put into there so this is a really good uh fancy bolster from shrade um vintage uh, 1979 
Um, but that's kind of fancy as you might see in the 70s on a bolster. And then you have this one produced by Taylor uh, Cutlery. Just um, really good work on this. And I know it's milled. It's not engraved, but uh, it's still really fantastic work. And then you have a really nice genuine bone here with some really fantastic colors. And it's dimpled. You see right there and browned and just just a fantastic looking little knife so uh, yeah i don't it's not expensive it's not rare i just don't use it because it's a great looking knife uh this one right here uh, moving up to the 90s is a um ag russell he produced this knife out of germany you can see right there and look at the scales on this knife so the covers on this knife are are um, mother of pearl and what russell did is he cracked this muscle uh, mother of pearl and put it at different angles so no matter how you turn this knife it it would fire up in mother of pearl and you see that right there look at that I've never seen anything like this in, in any of the knives that I've looked at, either personally or online or in a catalog. It's just absolutely phenomenal how he did that and what it took. I don't even know how he did it, what it took, but each one of these are set at different angles so that they, they fire up. And if you take this out of the light, I can't really do it because of the camera lights, but let me see if I can... Yeah, I can't, but uh, what happens when this is out of light? It looks like this. It's kind of like a snake skin olive color. But as soon as light hits it, it starts firing up. Uh, just really, really special knife. So uh, I don't use that because I don't want to mess it up. Uh, here's another AG Russell. And um, this is a really big. This is um, five. Five and a half inches and it's a muskrat and um you could uh, take this out use it camping really really fine knife and um nothing wrong with it beautiful beautiful stag but uh, it's just kind of indicative of the, of the invent uh innovation in knives uh, the artistry there's no reason to have this knife Right, A.G. Russell did it because he could, and he wanted to make something special, and he did. You know, this is a extra large um, muskrat. This is what it is. So, um, just really nice. Yeah, I don't use that at all. All right. So next is this one. Uh, I misplaced this and I forgot about it. So I was trying to like do a walk through history as knives kind of change, kind of thing. Uh, this should have been the second one I shown. Uh, it dates to 1840. And um, open this up. I bought some Peace and Company Sheffield. Um, really old date on this knife. This knife is solid, so it's a little, you know, twisted. You see there, it's gapping, um, but it's still a solid knife. You could take it out and use it. However, uh, this bone, you know, is 180 years old. So um, if you, you look down in there, you can see how decayed the bone is. And, um, you know, I wouldn't want to do that. This bone could crack. It's just really, it could just crumble. And it's a very fine uh, example of stag. And it's also... Ex transitionary knife so so in 18 early 1800s knives were typically this big from the 1700s up from 1700 1600 1700 into the 1800s they're they're really big this knife is over five inches let me show you this one this is a four and a half inch knife this is a big knife 
and look at it compared to this one right here. Just much bigger knife. And these were your typical hunting knives, you know, for hundreds of years. And um, they were evolving smaller. They were they were getting to this size right here, getting down to four inches. And um, and so this is one of the last knives really that was uh, this big. By the time you hit the 1860s, the knives for the most part are in the four inch range. You had some five inch dirks, things like that. But uh, most of your folding knives had already uh, morphed down into a smaller uh, platform. So that's why I don't, carry this around. I don't want to damage this beautiful old stag and a marvelous piece of history that that thing is. All right, so uh, this, I bought this not too long ago. This, this is made by Lee White in Sheffield. Just a wonderful uh, grade of mother of pearl here in a kind of, it's a, a different pattern. Uh, and that's what's so um, fabulous about Sheffield knife makers. They made all these different patterns. It's kind of like a dog leg, but it has really narrow, um, you know, bolsters here. It's not really an etric pattern, but it's a jack, a uh, two-bladed jack. And this thing is just absolutely fantastic. Um, high, deep mirror polish on it all of this is done by hand by lee white so it's basically a custom knife but uh, they sell them as factory knives look this is not milled this is hand filed by lee white and probably the finest example of a, a modern traditional folder you can get without going to to, to you know one of these really custom seven eight hundred dollar knife so um this was two 236 i think i paid for this um this case uh, mostly i have a lot of cases most of them i use or i will carry um this one i don't and um it's just because of this really cool uh golden honeycomb pattern it's just absolutely fantastic and i don't want to screw it up i don't want to get all this gold you know messed up there's really only two case knives that i have that i don't carry well actually now it's three yeah i got another one uh, that i don't carry this is one of them out of three uh some of the older um vintage knives i i don't carry those either uh from case but um not because I can't, I just got plenty of other knives. So um, this is a concept uh, knife, just one I really enjoy anodization in a knife. It's just cool. You can see the different colors popping up and anodization is cool. Maybe not for everybody, but um, this is just a fantastic knife here. And um, if you look close, I wonder if I can get it here. Let me try. Yeah, you can see the those are really tiny mill marks right there. You can feel them uh, with your finger if you go over. They're very slight. It's on that groove and it's on the top here. And then you can see it again on the bottom right there. And then this is just flat right here. So this is just an uh, amazing craftsmanship. And... Um, you have the anodization. Uh, beautiful Damascus blade on this. And just a good looking knife, isn't it? Just good looking knife overall. Really good action. Very well made. And um, that's I, I don't want to screw up this anodization. I got plenty of knives to carry. Um, this one right here, uh, this is a relatively inexpensive knife. It's from Japan. You can see the Japanese uh, caricature there. And um, really nice, nicely made knife. Look at the blade geometry. This is handmade blade. Look at that swedge on here. You got three different geometries on this blade. 
you got a flat grind, then you got a hollow grind here. Beautiful mirror polish on this knife. Look at that. And then you have a really nice looking carbon fiber right there. Well made knife. 154CM. Uh, but I don't carry it. It's uh, one of the few examples of, you know, uh, traditional Japanese knives that I have. And uh, that's why I don't really... I probably have carried this at some point. I'll get tired of it just sitting. Okay, so we're going to finish up. Uh, this is a modern traditional folder um, from Fox. Um, just fantastic. You have titanium um, scales here. Milled. Look, milled. Just kind of like goes away. And it comes out and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Really nice milling on this thing. Uh, the knife is basically perfect. You have mirror polish on your um, back spring. You have a, a scrolled millwork here. And then a uh, crowned back spring. And so the back spring is crowned and also the blade is crowned. So if you look at that blade, come on, snap in see that the blade is crowned it's not flat across there so the blade matches you can see matches the uh back there very elegant sharp looking knife and uh, fantastic slicey blade geometry you could certainly use this i actually didn't pay a lot for this i paid like 80 dollars for this um they go for like 150 though but yeah, you could definitely, you know, use this every day. It'd be a great knife. But um, to me, it's just a good example of craftsmanship. And uh, finally, this uh, River Cat from Kaiser. This thing just blew me away. And you have titanium scales that are um, uh, anodized. You have different colors. It's uh, green, blue, you got some yellows in there. And um, look at the attachment hardware is mirror polished. How often do you see that? So all that hardware is mirror polished. You have a really nice design here on the pivot. It's a closed pivot or uh, cap captured, captured pivot. S35VN steel. And look at the melon on this. So it starts off really tiny there and just gets bigger and bigger. And this would make a great EDC knife. This is very grippy. Um, great, great little knife. Um, nice geometry. Three different geometries. Uh, prominent swedge. Beautiful stone wash finish on this knife. That's polished. Look at your, um, your thumb stud there. So you get these little cuts in the thumb stud. That's kind of attractive, but if you turn it on the end, it also has like a little flower design on the top of it right there. See that? And it kind of looks like the insides of your uh, your uh, security torques. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing detail. Uh, really nice jumping on this knife. Nice action. Just a, this knife will just blow you away. Uh, high polished spacers on it. Every little detail about this knife is just fantastic. So that ends my uh, safe queens or wall hangers. And um, of course it ain't all. But uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. And um, it was informative to you. And I really appreciate you guys for checking it out.